It's a time-honored tradition, passed down from generations. And even though we don't know what tomorrow holds, we can do our part today. To ensure the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. Join today and help us ensure the future. Well, welcome to episode number 33 of According to Flint. And before going on air, we talked, this is kind of our first real timely episode of According to Flint. Now, I don't know how else to put that because we're calling it sort of, among other things, a World Finals, PBR World Finals wrap-up, opinions. What better person to do that? And also maybe talk a little music, talk about old Eugene, his pickup. He is one of and the most longtime voice of the arena at the Professional Bull Riders, Unleash the Beast Tour, our friend. The CA himself, Clint Atkins. How are you, buddy? Good to see you sitting there on your couch with a little cup of tea and a cookie and a blanket over your lap, like 89 Ooh. years old, Clint Atkins. It's good. I'd say it, it is good to see you, even though as yeah. we as we do this, it's only been a few days uh, coming off PBR World Finals. Different different kind of tired after the World yeah, Finals. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't quite recovered yet, but uh, there was a... There was something that epic happened when I got back to the house that really kind of changed my whole, uh, kind of got me going. I got home and found out that uh, McDonald's has brought back the McRib oh. nationally throughout the nation, Flint. And this was a big deal for me. <laughs> and I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Listen, I saw a commercial and I, for, and I honestly, I yeah. see the McRib commercial and I was right. going, which one of my friends is it that goes crazy for the McRib? It's you, man. <laughs> it's me. It's me. So if, if you're watching this or maybe listening to this going down the road, you, uh, you and I and our crew there uh, every week on the PBR, every once in a while it'll come up about our, fra- our favorite uh, breakfast sandwiches. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we, you and I are both on the same page that you know our favorite on-the-go fast food breakfast sandwich – has got to be McDonald's, yeah, you know, completely. you can go whatever you want to do, completely. you know, egg McMuffin, whatever have you. Yeah. And I don't eat anything else other than breakfast at McDonald's, but <laughs> McRib. Huh. Uh, let's, uh, I want everyone to know that before we hit record, we always have a little conversation before yeah. we start. And you said, I got huge news that I just found out that's really going to affect my winter schedule. <laughs> and uh, Clint, I was on the edge of my seat. I'm thinking, what did I miss? Did I not get an right. email? What's going on with the schedule? Where are we going? It's the McRib. Right. That's well, it. Well, I mean, it's it's a big deal because I just can't go down and like have fast food. Just no, you the don't. Burgers, just ah, but the McRib. Mm. That's a special deal, man. It only comes around. And think about this. It's been a couple of years since I've actually had one. Yeah, it has. So, you know. I'd like to know. Back- I'd like to know how much of that meat really is off the rib. I don't even know. Probably it- none. <laughs> Probably none. But it doesn't matter. Um, so it's all good. I want to. I, I didn't know in putting together a little a little note card to talk to you. I, I just mm-hmm. wrote items because I wasn't sure the path to take on how to discuss all that. So I want to start with this. When we're at the PBR finals, I just said a different kind of tired when we get home. There's something about PBR world finals. We do uh, big venues and important events all year, but there is a, for one, it's a few days longer. There's an intensity level and emotion and an emotional level in what goes to the PBR World Finals that at the end it's almost emotional. Does that make sense? It, when we leave, it there's al- it's almost emotional when we leave. It it, it does, and I, I think for me, I I put so much into it. Um, you know, we every week on the Unleash the Beast tour, you get into somewhat of a routine. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but the PBR world finals is its own unique event. And I know that it takes me a good week and a half leading into the event to prepare myself mentally. So in in my mind, I need to be prepared for, you know, 
for every scenario that I could come up with. Uh, and, uh, I've always said just for me personally, as a, as a commentator, the only way for people to sit in their seat and listen and digest what you have to say, you better be honest. You better have conviction in your voice. Uh, and it better be the truth. And people, you, you know what? You can't yeah. fake greatness. That's right. And you can't fake the truth. I mean, you'll mumble through it and people will just be able to see right through you. And this event is so complex. I mean, you know, I make a book every year. There I'm just going to bring up there. Clint Atkins there's makes, I was book. hoping you had that. Clint yeah. Atkins makes a three ring binder yep. of points, deals, everything. Uh, as everything. you were, as you were talking, Clint, it reminded yeah. me of, you know, my brother, Will, who's also an uh -huh. announcer, but uh, he, at one, he at one time was a head basketball coach, high school coach. Mm -hmm. It yeah. showed him Montana. And he told me one time, and, and it, it, the reason I, I really internalized it is because it fits so many things and it fits what you said. He said, my job as a coach is to know that whatever situation happens on that floor, and there's a lot of them, mm -hmm. as the head coach, I have a solution for it. I That's have right. to have a solution. When I watch you and we talk in our production meeting, sometimes I'm like, CA, man, you, there's just, you, you got so many details. Are you going to use them all? You might not. But you no. have them. You have a solution. No. There are so yeah. many points, things. We we yeah. anticipated that about Friday night or Saturday night, we would declare Jose Vitor Lemmy the world champion, that right. he didn't have it wrapped up. And people, we could not do that because of certain situations that came up. Right, yeah. I don't, I don't use 25% of this, but I'm prepared just in case for whatever scenario that goes and – the one thing that I think after five days of competition, <clears throat> uh, you know, the first day is it's it's easy because the stories haven't developed yet on 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 a right. you know you can go back and recap what they did for the season, but you know the toughest round for me as an announcer is round number two uh, when they bring in the 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 really the rankest buck and bulls of the weekend and all those guys have to face them there in round number two. Um, but, uh, you know, after that, I feel that if, I've, if I invest two weeks worth of time putting this together and then I only use 25% of it, to me, that's a win because I, I, I go into that arena confident. Now, understand that that two weeks is not the only time. Your original question was the emotional toll and the drain on it mm -hmm. because it takes, you know, I don't know, two and a half hours to debrief after each round. And then the next day I have to work another two and a half, three hours preparing for the next round, even after doing all this, but all of that preparation molds into, you know, two and a half hours. Uh, what the, uh, because the ultimate goal is to make sure that you do your job. The bulls do their job. The bull riders do their job. Our production team does their job. I do my job. We're all a spoke in a big wheel. And man, if we all do our job and that wheel goes around and around like it did for five days at this year's mm. PBR World Finals, you get magic. You get exactly what you expect. If you spend that money, you spend that time to go to Vegas, to go to the World Finals, and you walk out of there shaking your head going, I don't have any words to describe what I saw. Yeah. And, and in that <clears throat> point, our job is done. You, uh, good point. <clears throat> when, as the week goes, your prep increases because of the storylines. Yeah. And yeah. just so people know, as the week goes and those storylines to start to develop you and Matt West and, and all the team, as far as yeah. storylines does this yeah. and my yeah. role does this. Yeah. Because yeah. that Sunday I'm there for, we're live TV. So I'm there for commercials, but I've tried to explain that. I'll have people come up to me on the Sunday or even Saturday night. Boy, you didn't do as much. I know. They're just <laughs> right. too much. We're there. We're much. selling a sport. That, that, yeah. that, that's the key. When yeah. you talk about the production team, I lo always loved your analogy. Who was it talking in their band about if the bass player, if the bass yeah. player, what, what's your, it I don't was, remember it. it. It was Tracy Bird. That's right. Uh, you band. And, and, and uh, yeah, I, want, I don't know. It was in the mid nineties and, was doing uh, bull ridings with him for a long time and got to know one of his guitar players real well. And we were on a plane going somewhere. I, I, I don't remember. 
but he was talking to his bass player who was, I was sitting in between them. I had a middle seat and I had the bass player on one side of Tracy's band and the guitar player on the other. And he was like, yeah, I, I, I messed up a couple of times last night. He said, yeah, but that's all right. The rest of us picked you up and nobody really noticed. We knew that he was having a, just an off night. I mean, we, we all have them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he was just having one of those off nights and everybody else picked it up and you roll on. And that's, uh, that's, that really happens with us too. We may not be, you know, hitting on a drum or, or, or a guitar, but it is truly, uh, everybody's got to be together and we all have to be on the same page to, to, to make, uh, to do our little part. You know, that <clears throat> when you've got my mind going, about it. And I don't know if people, I I would think a lot of people are interested in that dynamic. When you look at what happens in that live arena, there's guys in the truck putting graphics up, video clips we need, camera angles I need. You're right. It's, it's unbelievable what happens, but the flow of that show goes, there's you and Matt who work so good together without ego and that's a that's a big deal. You got sure. Dan Hickman calling the show, Richard Jones playing the music, and I'm in the arena. And those spokes, those spokes you talked about, they yeah. got to be rolling. Yeah. That's where that yeah. whole tone of that show comes from. I, you all have to feed and know. We all kind of got to know what each other's thinking a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I learned that lesson a long time ago when I was doing amateur rodeos and. I had a big one uh, up in North Texas, and and I noticed after the first round, I was or the first night there weren't rounds. It was like a three night rodeo, mm. and I noticed I was having real problems getting through the event. I mean, it just didn't flow. And I was young in my career, and I got to thinking, man, what do I got to do here to 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 make this thing work right? Well, I identified what my problems were, and I figured out well, it was happening down in the roping box. And the guys were messing around and I, I got them all together. And I'm like, you know what, man, every one of us are spoken a wheel. I'm no better than the guy that's putting those calves in order. If they're not in order, things don't work right. It slows the thing down. And, and I, I just learned teamwork really, really, really early in my career. And, and uh, that and the fact that no, those people aren't there to listen to me. They're there to watch a rodeo. And I'm just a guide to help them along. And, uh, but I can't do my job without those men and women in that truck. And if they don't feel just as proud to be there as I am, and they're not engaged and the fire's not running in their belly to do their best, uh, nothing's going to happen. Right. And so it, I'm very fortunate. You and I both are very fortunate to work with the best team, uh, in the world. And our, our boss keeps, uh, is doing a really good job of keeping everybody engaged and, and everybody feel like uh, is, excuse me, feels like that they're part of the team. And, uh, man, it's, it's, it, when it all comes together, it's a magical formula, you know? So I'm proud, I'm proud to be a part of it because there's not anybody else. I'm going to go ahead and say this now that it's all over and I'm on my couch. There's nobody in Western sports that's doing it any better than what we are. I agree. I agree. I think uh, it's easy to get jaded. Yeah. Travel, travel, travel. We're tired. We start picking ourselves apart and thinking, and people start complaining. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? And I'm like, whoa, come on, guys. We're the standard here, and that's yep. hey. I but we both have a rodeo background. We love rodeo. That's yeah. not. Yeah. But as far as that show, I think. And now, listen. I remember back. There was no greater atmosphere at any sporting event I've ever been to than when J.B. Mooney and Silvano Alves were battling it out, oh, you know, yeah. in that moment. But right. as far as far as a world finals, consistent click, 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 the competition, the atmosphere, the energy, the last three days of this PBR world finals, I, I felt as good about it as any I've ever been to. And, and the bull rider stepped up. Yeah. There were, I mean, you know what? Yeah, I, I didn't know which direction you wanted to go on this and, and there were so many writers. There were so many different stories from, you know, rookie of the year, PBR World Finals event, uh, you know, a- aggregate winners, the world championship. There were so many guys that stepped yeah. up that you just really didn't think, you know, 
<laughs> that were going to be yeah. able to do it that did it. And then there were others that you really thought, of, hey, I'm going to go ahead and push my chips all on him. And, you yeah. know, I'll take take a Boudreaux Campbell. Well, hey, you know, okay, so he was the I just want you to know that's a great segue because, listen, I made a note. Always right. surprises at the world finals. Yeah. Good or bad. So okay. you just started the conversation. All right. Good surprise. Well, wait, you led into Boudreaux Campbell. Surprises yeah. that you thought were going to go the other way. Boudreaux Campbell is one of those in a not so good way in his book. Yeah, but I was looking a little while ago before we got on air here at the Bulls that he that he drew. Oh. And I don't know where Boudreaux's deal is here. There's so many of them. I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, but I remember I, he had Dennis the Menace in round number two. Yeah. Uh, that bull, I believe, until Wu Paw bucked was 47 and a half, maybe. Yes. 47 and a quarter. Um, and he was basically leading the Yeti bull of the finals race until Wu Paw. And it, I mean, that, that was, I, I don't know who could have ridden that bull there in round number two. He was just, I don't either. He was, he was a giant. And then he had Liston, I believe, in round number four. I don't remember the name of the bull that he got on in round three. But, man, he drew some heavy hitters. Big. He really did. You know, he kept that 78 or 76, whatever it was, in the first round. And I knew exactly what he was going to do. He was, you know, obviously just going to going to shoot for going five of six if he could. And, and that, that could have won him the PBR World Finals. But, uh, obviously, it didn't work out that way. That was the great – the great factor is, is the bullpen. And, you know, there's two totally opposite scenarios. You look at the pin of bulls that, that Boudreaux drew, and then you look at the pin of bulls that Silvano Alves drew. And Good point. You know, there is somewhat of a luck of a draw type deal, and that came in, but Boudreaux just drew the short stick that week. And, man, when, when he did, you know, go in there and, and, and draft a bull, I mean, he didn't have the best draft pick. Yeah, and we because all know what night, happens on the draft deal. We're right. Night two is when yeah. he was one point four seconds, and that's, that's the night right. they drafted after. So he gets a crappy draft pick. Then it just snowballs. Right, right, right. and they did that by time, you know. So yeah. it, it, it's a it's a tough deal, and and uh, you know what, I, I I hold nothing up against Boudreaux because I expect him to to come back and he'll have his week, and you know. And hey, and, hey, uh, I want to backtrack it just a tiny yeah. bit and, yeah. because it's on my mind, Silvano Alves. Uh-huh. Uh that we we got to know him. You've known him a little bit, but we got to know right. him. He stayed with us in Binford, North Dakota, flew him up there. Yeah. Uh this summer. He stayed in the house with us, cooked us steaks, hung out. I got to know him a little different, and I found myself cheering for him more now that I know who he is. Cause man, the guy pisses me off sometimes. I mean, he'll sit there and take that clock to three seconds every time. Yeah. And that does, it's like, come on, man. But that's his yeah. MO. It's, yeah. but I was excited for the guy 33 or whatever. He looked good. It, he drew the right bulls. Yeah. I kind of yeah. cheer for the guy now though. You know, you know, I, and, and I do too. I, I, I've, I like Silvano and, and, uh, you know, the, he and, and Kaiki, have have came here with a different mode now i understand you know silvano has been here since what 2010 i think is when he finally came here so we're talking over 11 years and you know he decided he didn't want to get off into the fray of the media attention he wanted to right. stay away from that and uh you know glare may coming before him didn't shy away from the camera and so he he decided that's that's the mode that he wanted to take. Kaiki's taking that same mode. But when you peel the onion back, there's a lot of layers of those guys. And Silvano, yeah. you know, I've always said this. I, you know, I know like Silvano's wife and his children, mm -hmm. they are just absolutely unbelievable type people. And you can't raise a child or two children like that and and marry such an awesome woman and not be a good yeah, guy. Yeah, and yeah. he truly is. He just, he has this front. He, I, I, we and, joke, I joke all the time that Silvano, yeah. Silvano Alves has made a living pretending he doesn't speak English. That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's a, he pretends he doesn't like it. He's like, oh, I'm mad. And like, no, that's not the case. Yeah. But, but listen, let me, let me, 
let me go back to to where I think he has been. So so what happened to Silvano is really the thing from a performance standpoint. And 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 I think, you know, Cody Teal got has, has got off into a little bit of this too. And 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 he and I talked about this at the airport um uh Sunday night. Before I, I left about, I think we were both on, we were on different planes, but we both left about one o'clock in the morning and, and we were talking about this. You can forget really quickly on this tour why you started. Mm. There is a fire there. You know, there's a reason why I know just for myself and, and everybody included at some point, when you're either amateur rodeoing or you go into college rodeos or whatever you're doing, at some point you make a decision to go, Hey, I want to go spend my career. I'm going to get the best I can. And I want to go to the NFR and I want to go win a PRCA world championship or, Hey, I'm going to go to the PBR and I want to win a PBR world championship. If you're a bull rider. And it's easy to forget after a while, why it's fun, why you made the journey. And, and, you know, the cameras, the lights and everything, and it can affect your performance. And, uh, I, I, you know, I just look at Cody Teal. I think he's, you know, I know that he's kind of lost a little bit of that fire and he found it this week. You really had to go back and go, why, why did I do this? Why did I come here in the first place? And because there's always that fire that drives that engine that keeps you wanting to go and accelerate and, and push it to the edge because these guys at this level and, and honestly, in anything that you do, you know, if it's NASCAR, golf, baseball, football, you've got to push yourself to the edge. You got to be disciplined in your life. That's number one discipline, knowing that the goal is, is to be the best at something. Then you got to know exactly what you're doing and whatever discipline that that is. And then you have to be able to push it to the edge because your true skills will not manifest itself until you take whatever discipline you're doing yourself to that edge. And that's where greatness comes from. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's easy to get it's easy to forget that because it's hard to do that, Flint. It's hard to do that every week. I mean, it truly is. And uh, I, I think going back to the question about Silvano and Cody and, you know, I, I think they went back and truly looked, them, looked, looked themselves in the mirror because it's not the Bulls. It's not the judges. It's not the, the company. The person you have to look at for your own success and failure is looking at you right back in the mirror. So Locker room talk one week. Yeah. Great topic that you bring up. We were all tired. Remember, we were, uh, I think people would be surprised what we talk about in the locker room. Uh, Uh, And Clint, you always lead us into a deeper subject. You're a deep thinker. I mean, and I mean that as a compliment. Remember when you went around the room and you said, I'm sure it was you asking, why'd we start? Why'd why'd you want to do this? Oh, yeah. Jesse Byrne said, easy answer. I wanted to be the best. Right. Bullfighter. You want, I wanted to save the, I wanted to be the best. Why'd you do it? Well, cause da, da, da. And you went to me, what about you? Why'd you do this? And I said, well, I kind of got into it once and it was fun. So, but, and you stopped me. You said, bam, it was fun. That's right. It's fun. Yeah. Sometimes we get caught up in production and TV and this and flying and cancel flights. It's supposed to be fun. We're not right. curing cancer here. We're not, right. we're not stopping terrorism. We're, Right. It got, right. if it's not fun, our fun transfers to the people who pay yeah. to get in. They want to yeah. see fun. Anyway, I, right. it was a great right. conversation. No. no, you're right. And, and, you know, I kind of go, I, I get, I, I get very introspective mm-hmm. to myself and I think I try to stay humble and myself after Joe, after Jose rode Wupa and that whole thing went down there was a moment Flint for about 30 seconds that all these memories kept flooding back into my head about all of the nights and the miles and the trucks and the trailers and everything that it took for 14 years to get the job that when, once I had finally made the decision, because I just, it's not like in 2006, the phone rang and Hey, this is a PBR. Y'all want to come up? No, I seeked that out. 
for 12 years. I knew 12, 14 years before that phone call actually came that if I wanted to do this, it was going to be with this brand. And for 20, 30 seconds after watching Jose, I went, man, this was all worth it. It truly was all worth to be at this moment, at this time alive and to be there to watch what I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put it in this scenario in 19, I was born in November of 1973. And before I was born, Secretariat ran one of the greatest races of any thoroughbred ever at the Belmont. Now it was amazing what that horse was able to do in the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness, but the, the, the third and final leg of Belmont. that yeah. was something to behold. And, and I'm going to say if, if somebody's watching this or somebody's listening to this that hasn't seen what secretary it did at the Belmont, just Google it and watch it. it makes you cry. It truly, It'll make it you does. cry. Yeah. Well, I'll tell this story. I'll tell this story. And I don't know if I've ever shared this with you, but uh, Jack Nicholas, the great golfer, uh-huh. um, he he was at home and he watched the race live. His wife had, I don't know, she'd gone off somewhere and he said, hey, I was at the house and I turned on the coverage to watch the Belmont because I wanted to see Secretariat. And he said, you know, he said, I knew a little bit about horse racing, but he wasn't, you know, big into it. And as Secretariat came around that final turn to head for home, and that horse's lead was continuing to, 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 to grow. He said, I, 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 I found myself on my knees on my carpet. And I was banging on the carpet going, go Secretariat, go Secretariat. He said, next thing I knew, I was crying. And he said, Secretariat won. And about four or five hours after that, he called one of his friends who was a sports writer. And I don't remember if it was Time Magazine or what it was. And, and then this guy had, was friends with Jack and was an exclusive thoroughbred writer. And Jack asked him, said, hey, why in the world? What did I just see? He said, I, I was on the ground. I was crying, beating on the carpet going, go, Secretariat. What in the world was what was happening to me? What was happening to secretary at that moment? And the sports writer said something very profound. He said, Jack, throughout your whole career, you have been in the pursuit of perfection in your discipline. And he said, what you saw and what you witnessed and the reason your emotions were the way that they were is because you witnessed perfection firsthand. And he said, you were seeing perfection. Mm-hmm. And that's where that emotion comes out. And, 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 and what I saw on Sunday is something that I had been chasing for 30 years and, and a tear came down. And it's the first time I've ever cried at a bull riding. And, yeah. and I did. I mean, you know, over something that had happened in, you know, yeah. uh, you know, that actually happened in a bride is because for all my life, it, I, I feel like I was Jack Nicholas in 1973 because I'd been in pursuit of perfection Seeing that. in this discipline. And it wasn't me, but it was, I was a part of it. I was there. And all of those emotions come running back of everything that it took me to put myself mm-hmm. in that arena at that time. It was magical, man. It was magical. It. Uh, it, as long as, uh, by the way, we yeah. can weave however we want here. Okay. I don't know if as, I'm going too long. No, or not. no, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Great thing about podcasts. There's no time limit. Oh, well, that's so, good. I got a video that we're sharing what all this does. I'm stuck in on a plane uh, trying to get out of Vegas late night. And where he was, was very late. I get a video from chase outlaw on my phone. Okay. It was a video. I don't know if it was off the TV. It was kind of blurry or something. Somebody did, but he goes, look at you, look at your reaction. It's like you're saying, holy shit, what do they do now? (laughs) Kind of. So I watch this video and it pans across. Uh, All the guys ran out and picked up Jose. And I turned, might have been to Cody Lambert. And I went, Mm -hmm. and I had had my hand on my head like this. And I went, well, and that's exactly, he read what, what do we do now? Like, now that I've seen this, now what do we do? And it was, notice something, Clint. Yeah. You can go on social media, not a ton of them. 
there's always those armchairs that say, judge has got a little excited there. I mean, this, this, this. You notice the people critical of the score or of the ride or doubt it are the ones that were not there in person to see it. Mm -hmm. You notice that? Because TV, I've used this analogy a lot. First thing people say when they go to an NFL game is, holy crap, I never realized they were this big and this fast. Because it doesn't translate to video. It It doesn't doesn't. translate to TV. Why would it be any different with our sport? The as fast as Wu Paul was moving, as high as he was getting in the air, and how perfect Jose was riding them. I watch that that now on social media, wherever that video is posted. There is no comparison to being 30 feet away from that sucker. Yeah. It was yeah. a I looked at Cody Lambert and he said, he's going to be 99 points. If Cody Lambert says that, how can you argue with that? Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know what? I stay off social media or, you know what? I take, hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to address what you, what you brought up, but I will have to say, you'll be proud of me. I actually opened up my Instagram this week. Uh, The real Clint Atkins. Uh, You know what? I got to get back on. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, um, yeah, there's all. I mean, there's always going to be haters. There's always going to be doubters. You brought up a good point. I won't spend much time on it. The bottom line is our sport uh, is uh, there's nothing like watching it live. And and the very first, <clears throat> pardon me, the very first PBR event I ever went to, um, you know, I'd watched a couple of them on television. This was in the early days when they would <laughs> they would film a bull ride and it'd come on sixty days later. Right. And, oh uh, yeah. 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 Go home you know? and watch it. Yeah. And uh, so when I first went in there and saw those bulls, and I went, whoa, whoa. And then I'd go back to the little amateur rodeos that I was doing and going, yeah, this is not the same. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, there's there's obviously and there's going to be people like that and everything. And I just I don't listen to them. Uh, I don't pay attention to any of that. And and uh, I will say this: there was a moment I saw Ty Murray out there on the dirt and he was he was sitting there looking at jose up on the center cage the the can-am cage and he just had this look on his face it was a smile and he just sat there and he stared at him and i went what's going through ty's head right now like here's a guy that in the three disciplines of rodeo and honestly i bet if you put a rope in his hand he was probably really good at the other ones you know, yeah. uh, but you know, bareback riding, saddle bronc riding and bull riding him, the king of, of the Cowboys, Ty Murray is looking at Jose Vitor Lemmy and he's got a smile on his face. And I just casually walked over there and I said, Ty, what a moment it is to be alive and to be right here and, and watch this. And he just said, simply amazing. And so he and I walked over to Jose and I'm okay with saying this because he did it in front of all the reporters he did this to Jose. Ty Murray did that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Think yeah. about that. It's funny. And then what I'll, else, what else I, do you I, need to know? Yeah. I'll go back to what I, I said. I mean, I'm sorry. That's a yeah. that's a drop the mic moment for me. Yeah. That's a I, drop the mic. I, I go back to what I said where they'll go, Oh yeah, the judges make sure Jose gets the points. They oh this and that. You just ask Ty Murray. Yeah. Listen, yeah. Joe Joe from from Georgia, I, I'm, I'm okay. sure that you're a great fan and know a lot about bull riding. Yeah. I'm going with Ty Murray on this one. Yeah. I mean, with all due respect. Yeah. No, yeah. With, without any respect yeah. at all. I'm going yeah. with Ty Murray. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, oh, they're my just, gosh, uh, yeah. it, I, I had a guy, you know, fans stop you at the most inopportune times and ask sure. you questions. That, But I came over. Right after confetti was falling, and I took yeah. my microphones off. I was in what we call front of house, where the announcers yeah. are. And there's been a guy sitting behind you all week, and he was <laughs> rolling. Last two performances, yeah. yeah. And he leaned over to me in that moment and said, besides that ride, what's the greatest ride you've ever seen? Good timing with yeah. the question. But I just turned to him, and I said, the other one he made. 
<laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. The other one. Those are uh, the two greatest rides I've ever seen. I tell you what, if you wanted to to go and have a conversation about rides right now, you go and you look at Jose's first ride on Wupaw at Tulsa and then Dalton Castles at San Antonio. I want to break those two rides down side by side. The one at the World Finals was above both of those two. Yeah. But those two, like, I, you know, I would really like to go back and have those on side by side. Look at the breakdown of how the PBR does their judging because I love Dalton Castle. Yeah. Right? I felt, I mean, I really do, I felt like Wupa had another, an, an extra jump of this with, with Jose. Okay. Yeah. But I, yeah. And I've seen this stuff on TV, Clint. I know what I'm talking. Hey, just about. the time or two, man. Yeah, <laughs> just the time or two. Uh, we won't. We won't break that ride down right yeah, now. Yeah, but the, uh, the the Jose winning the world title. I mean, that's one thing. Yeah. Uh, I talked about surprises at the at the world finals every year. Something happens. You go, mm-hmm. how the hell did that happen? Like a guy will buck off everything or whatever. Okay. But I'm All going. Right. Uh, check me if I'm wrong. I felt in my mind the two biggest surprises. Great guys, great riders. Eli Vassbinder and Mason Taylor. Yeah. Holy yeah. crap. Hey, and I, oh, this this will be not controversial, but don't take it yeah. the wrong way. Okay. We needed two young American riders to to do that. Well, that's that's, that's I, I mean not that's just controversial. Yeah, yeah I mean, no, you know, you know, yeah, that's fact. I mean, fact. you know, I expected. Listen, I you know Mason uh, Mason's got off into the same problem that Cody's gotten off into. I expected that out of. Uh, Adam Mason Taylor. talent wise. Yeah. Yeah. I expected that. That's exactly the way you should be riding each and every week, you know, and, and, uh, you know, the bottom line is Jose Vitor Lemmy thinks about bull riding every second of the day and every decision that he makes is, is this going to benefit me in the arena or not? And that's a fact. I, I didn't, I don't make that up. That that's comes, true. That came out of his mouth. And the bottom line is, is he is resolute with the fact that he is going to uh, uh, dedicate his life that way for a moment in time because he knows it's only going to last so long. And that's why he's breaking the records and he will, you know, unless something unfortunate happens, he's going to do things that this sport that uh, the sport's never seen before. Now, so I expected Mason Taylor. I expect Mason Taylor to be more disciplined. I expect him to ride that way. I, I do not know Eli Vassbinder all that well. I'd seen some videos of him. I studied him a little bit right before the finals, but I didn't I didn't know that he had that in him. That's a tough cat right there. And mm-hmm. what he did at the world finals, I tip my hat to him, you know, because that's that's cowboy stuff right there. And, uh, yeah, I just, you know, I said this to Matt West <clears throat> when he walked up there on the stage and got his buckle. I said, it's a dang shame. He's not 23 years old. Yeah. He's 30 years. He's been around. Yeah. 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 So yeah. making, uh, but, uh, yeah, that's, uh, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I'm glad to see those guys step up and, and because there are some Brazilian bull riders, I've, I won't go down that rabbit hole unless you want. No, to, I'm going to. Uh, I, I'm Brazilian bull ride. I have that. I want to talk about that. Okay. Here, here's a something about Mason Taylor. Yeah, I don't know if people realize that some of the great performances in sports <clears throat> ever, any professional sport, have occurred when a guy is sick. You know, Michael Jordan with the flu right. game in the NBA Finals yeah. in Utah, uh, or injured. Uh, such and such with a broken whatever or the Brett Favre performance the week his dad passed away you can list right. them Mason yeah. Taylor comes in with a broken jaw I remember the best basketball game in high school I ever played I was yeah. sick as a dog Yeah, and funny I remember that but what happens is you, all your strength and energy goes into accomplishing who I don't feel good. I'm hurting. I got to accomplish that. When really that's the focus we should have every time it happens. I think Mason Taylor in breaking that jaw, he focused so much on riding the right way and doing things. I think it helped, helped him in a sense. Flint, this is the best way I can put this. And it's a darn shame. I'm going to have to go back to the thoroughbred world to answer this. You're kind of a thoroughbred though. That's, I mean, in general. (laughs) I don't know about that, but. This is the best way I can put this, and if we could do this with people, because what you're describing is exactly what trainers do when they put blinders on horses. Mm -hmm. 
so they're not looking. They're only focused forward. And when you're sick or you have something happen to you, you just describe it. That's the reason why, because you're, you're, you know, you have a job to do And Mason Taylor. What else could he do besides walk around? Yeah. He's not going down to eating a, you know, filet mignon at Michael's at South point. That's not <laughs> happening. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so you're singularly focused on something and, and the task at hand, you know, like your greatest game that you had, you know, when you were sick. What were you focused on that day? Was it your girlfriend? No. Well, I was, well, no, I was 17. Okay, so you might have been. been. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, You're right. But, You're right. Well, I mean, think about it. And, and yeah. you know, that's why, like, when I go to the world finals, you know, my wife, she's at home and my children aren't there. It's me. And I have one job to do. And I know that I put blinkers on. I don't go drinking. I don't go out partying. You have one thing. And singular focused on that. My job is to be the best in the world. Your job is to be the best in the world. Those bull riders, the bulls, focused. And when you're not focused, you you get yeah. zero for five. Let's you know. Yeah. Let's be clear. So, you never go out drink. You never go out drinking or partying. <laughs> you know, I used to. You, you used to. <laughs> Uh, hey, I used to. Hey, hey, you touched on something. Uh, and I, I made a note yeah. to myself about this. You really study this stream of Brazilian riders coming to the country. Yeah. The comparison. Yeah. Here's what I find interesting. This is what I want you to address. You watch okay. videos of them riding in Brazil. The styles of bulls, the styles of riding, because frankly, it's different here. There's an right. adjustment to be made. You make predictions based. Don't always want pick the one that's been the most successful in Brazil, mm -hmm. but the one that you analyze and see mm -hmm. how he's going to do here. What, what do they got to bring? What do they got to leave home to make it in the PBR? What, what, give me some keys that you look for there. Well, you know, that's, I mean, man, there's so many different ways I can yeah. answer that, but I, I do study a lot of the Brazilian bull riders. First, let me address why I, I, I study them. Uh, not just, you know, the, the ancillary answer would be just, well, because I'm a PBR announcer and there's Brazilian bull riders. I connect with the Brazilian bull riders and how, why I connect with them is basically the parallel story of how I grew up. Um, you know, and, and I won't, we won't go off into detail about that, but there's a lot of parallels in how they grow, grew up and how I did. I mean, we didn't grow up with a lot of money and, you know, we, we heated our home with wood and, and we didn't have air conditioning and you showered you know, in was, the dark a lot. I, I did do yeah. that. That's for sure. And, uh, you know, I connect with their stories and this is something that a lot of people in America, I know a lot of American fans, they just, they, they miss this portion of this. I went to Australia one time for three weeks. I left my wife and my children and, you know, the country. And now the cool thing about that was, is I spoke the same language. So I didn't have that barrier up, but I just, as much as I enjoyed my time of being over in Australia, I was so homesick. I wanted to come home. I mean, you know, be on my couch and sleep in my bed and eat the food that I wanted to eat just for three weeks, three weeks. That's as long as I was gone. And, oh, I was so ready to come home. I look at those guys and how they grow up, how they grew up. And then I look at the differences in their money and our money and how much it takes for them just to buy a plane ticket to get over here. Then the fact that they have to leave their wife or their mom or their dad, their aunts or their uncles, and they're not coming back in three weeks. They may come back in a year from now, maybe two years from now. And they have to leave everything that they've ever owned, that they've ever owned or know, get on a plane, go to America. Most of them are going to go live in an apartment building in Decatur. And don't get me wrong. It's a lot easier for them right now than what it was when Adriano first came over uh, for the very first time 30 something years ago or 28 years ago, whatever it was. And then they have to qualify to get on the Unleash the Beast tour. Then once they do, they have to go up against the best, the biggest, baddest, fastest, rankest bulls every week and do all of that with a language barrier, eating food. Good gosh, I don't even know if they've, you know, I mean, I know McDonald's in Australia is different than McDonald's here in, in America, okay? <laughs> yeah. 
It, it is. Yeah. But but I just look at what they go through, Flint. Okay, I'll wrap this up. No, I'll this look is at what they go I like through, it. and there's a. To me, I I empathize with their story uh, because I've had listen, I've had it great over here. I can talk all day long about how I grew up, make you feel sorry. Oh, you know, oh sorry for him. No, we have it so good over here, and uh, I'm I'm grateful for what we have. And and these Brazilian bull riders, they truly are fantastic uh, people. Um, I, I love a lot. I love the fact that a lot of them are steeped deep into faith, and uh, that's that's so refreshing to see. And then to uh, see them come over here and be popular. So that's why I empathize with them. So far as there's some young talent coming up, mm-hmm. and this kind of I believe was the the very sure. end of your of your question. The bulls in Brazil that they ride over there are bigger than the bulls that they get on here, but they're not as fast as the bulls here in America. Uh, they, they, you know, just take whoop off for instance, as he's the world champion bucking bull. Uh, they've got some great bulls over there, but they're different. Um, you know, they, they have a lot of knee lore, which is that people say, Oh, they, they have Brazilian bramers and they do, but they're, they're called Nalor cattle is what they, what they call them over there. They look like bramer cattle, but they have uh, smaller bones on them. They're taller. Uh, and, and they just buck different. So that's why you see a lot of times when, when Brazilian riders get a bull over here that jumps real high and is real kind of a lumbering around in a circle, they just dominate on those bulls because that's what they've ridden over there. Uh, the breeding program in Brazil has just gotten underway. In fact, the last four or five years is, is really the first time that they started breeding bucking bulls over there. Uh, they're the guys that I believe are going to have, uh, success coming over here, are probably going to be those Jose Vitor Lime type looking guys mm-hmm. far as frame wise, you know, uh, there's a lot of great bull riders over there that are bigger, taller, they carry more weight. Uh, but there is a young man and I'm going to go ahead and put it out there right now that y- you better remember this kid, ca- this kid's coming. And he's 19 years old. <clears throat> His name is Philippe Ferlon. And in my opinion, uh, J- Jose better hurt, hope he stays down there for a couple <laughs> of years. You've uh, told this, me about Philippe. You yeah, brought him up to me. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I get a little bit of pushback from the Brazilians down there. Cause I, I, you know, I watched like last night. I, I, I hate to even say this. I was so tired. Flint. I fell asleep during it. I watch live bull riding on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and, and Thursdays from Brazil on YouTube. And, uh, and, uh, because they, you know, they're locked down down there. They is that when you're not, through. is that when you're not watching like TJ hooker, Beverly Hillbillies? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love, oh, gosh, yeah. let's not go down this rabbit hole yeah, of Pluto no. TV because uh, I love Beverly Hillbillies and TJ hooker <laughs> and all that stuff. So, uh, oh, don't forget heart to heart, heart to heart, heart, to heart. Uh, that's the other hey, one. Hey, yeah. Mrs. H. Hey. My wife, my wife hates that show. <laughs> <laughs> she hates it. But anyway, uh, so so Philippe Verlon, <laughs> yeah, he's coming. Uh, so, yeah, I watch those guys down there. Uh, there are bull riders down there, Flint, that uh, ride more bulls than what Philippe does. Like when you look at the standings, he's, he's in the top 10 or he's consistently in the top 15. But the bigger riders are, have got more points. But the reason that that is is because they're getting on bigger bulls. Okay, we've had those. You have to make the yeah. con- you have to make the conversion. Yeah, but we've and had in my mind. We've had those guys too. I, I'm well, just right. the the yeah. DeSouza twins. Uh, right. There was another right. guy that was really big just two years ago. Uh, right. You probably remember. There's been those big guys come over here and they'll do yeah. okay, and then yeah. they're gone. Right. And, yeah. and, 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 and to me, I think that's, that's, you know, that's success in Brazil is not going to convert to success in America because of the difference in the bulls. Okay. And I think that that conversation will change in 20 years as they get their breeding program together. 
uh, down there, those bulls will get smaller. They'll actually become marginal to, to like right now, weight wise, those bulls are here in Brazil and America. They're here. But what's going to end up happening is it's going to come down to this point as the breeding because airtime breeding is down there now. There are several other bulls that are starting to get bred. And so you'll see that change. Well, that's also going to change when you, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just going to be the way nature is. Those guys are going to have to get down yeah. there uh, because those bulls just won't buck as good with them, yeah. uh, with those bigger guys on there. Sure. So I look at a guy like Philippe Ferlam, and I said this a little while ago, I get a little pushback from the folks in uh, in in Brazil about that. And uh, But um, that's just because I'm looking at it through, through my lens as converting over into America. Your lens is like a weird well, Snapchat filter. Like yeah, you got all kinds of weird damn filters going on. Sometimes it's John Connolly's rose colored glasses. Oh, Sometimes John, John. <laughs> uh, oh my let's God, see. You're terrible. Let's, yeah. You got, you're a music guy, man. Yep, we just discussed uh, Steve music. Warner. You got yep. some Ronnie Millsap. You're I obsessed do. with Conway Twitty. Obsessed with his story. I, uh, got his members I, only uh, jacket. Just rocking the, you're, yeah, you're, you're, I'm I, telling well, you. Well, I'm just looking. I'm looking at my. <laughs> so, the Statler brothers. Statler brother. Oh. Uh, uh, He's bed of roses that hey, I do lay. You remember, on. Do you That's remember Statler. Ricochet? The band oh, Ricochet. I knew that. I was friends with those guys. Yeah. Heath and Junior. I, oh yeah. Um. Uh, obviously, yeah. Randy Travis. Love Keep it Randy going. Travis. Oh yeah. I got. Come hey, on. I got Phil, I got Phil Collins on here. Yeah. Uh, the Oak Ridge it's, Boys. Oh yeah. Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Uh, Michael Martin Murphy, Merle Haggard, Marty Stewart, Mark Chestnut, Cody Johnson. As fact, I'm getting ready to go have some Cody Johnson brisket tacos at, at the, the place favorite. where Cody always yeah. goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I bet you I need to reach. I, I don't. Hey, know Chancey what, Will, you gotta get some Chancey yeah. Williams on there. Chancey's got some. You good know, I don't one. have any Chancey. You gotta get some. Rodeo so, cold beer on there. I well, just I'm on here, so Chancey Williams. Yeah. I tell you what, I will. Uh, let me find him right here. I got him. I'll get it. I'll get okay. that on there, man. All right. Listen to me a little bit of Chancey Williams. Um, as uh, let's look f- just a little forward for PBR fans watching this. Yeah. What does next? What does the adjustment in the season hold? For everyone, I mean, I know what it holds for us production-wise. It's going to be a grind. We're going to do, yeah. we're going to do some midweek events. We're going to do about twenty and or nineteen or twenty in about sixteen weeks. Uh, it's yeah. going to be a condensed season. What what are guys going to have? What's the key for them? I I'll tell you. I asked uh, who did I ask? I think Mason Taylor on my show, and mm-hmm. he said training conditioning. Um, yeah, might have been somebody else. Anyway. What do you think? What do guys, what do we expect? Coming well, up? I, I, you know, I like, yeah, Mason's Mason's answer there. Conditioning is going to be critical because you're uh, with them throwing, <clears throat> pardon me, with them throwing an event in, in the middle of the week, uh, your recovery time is going to be cut less. So, you know, that's really, that's two events that your body is going to have to recover very, very, very quickly. Uh, if you're 19, 20 years old or eliminating you're in perfect shape and you work on it, you, you can navigate through that a lot easier than a guy that does it. Uh, so I think that is going to be a big issue, uh, the recovery time. Uh, and if you're doing that once a month – so that's January, February, March, April. So that's four weeks. That's two, four, six, eight. That's eight events that you're going to have an issue with recovery right. as far as your body recovering. Okay. Uh, and I'm just using that on the average and I'm not a hundred percent positive. If every one of those, you know, midweek events will, will take place. We'll find out, see what that, those, that's for people way up the pay scale than myself right. to decide. <laughs> Uh, so I think it's going to be that the PBR world championship. Uh, I, I just hope everybody stays healthy, man. You know, it's a part of this deal and one thing can happen and it's over. Well, and that, that's, yeah. that's the downside. That's that I the downside. The, exactly. Yeah. And here's here, here is the deal with injuries and bull riding. 
-hmm. everybody visualizes that it's always a wreck. You know, somebody gets in a wreck and gets hurt. Well, people like Jose, you name them, they keep themselves out of wrecks. They're not in wrecks. But we saw it uh, a month ahead of the PBR finals. Jose not only did not get in a wreck, he won the event and was 90 and a half points. Mm -hmm. But pulled his groin. Groins are the nightmare yeah a bull ride yeah. pulls his groin on the bull that's what that's what we're gonna have to watch for it, yeah. it isn't a oh, yeah. it's, it's a real know. deal it's a it's 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 a real thing and we'll have to uh just have to go with it because i mean there's really no other options right now the way that the season is going to be reset uh i think that narrative <clears throat> might change depending on uh, what they do in 2023 Right. But it doesn't look like that that's going to change a whole lot. I was really thinking that we would probably end up going, you know, on the Unleash the Beast tour from, let's say, October, November, maybe having one in December. You know, I'm talking for 20. Yeah, exactly. That When it yeah. re, when it can yeah. balance, readjust right. itself. Yeah. But that doesn't look like that's going to be the case again. And it may be 2024 by the time they, they end up getting to that point. We'll see. The whole PBR teams deal is going to put a – put a wrench in that. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know we see. both work for the company, so we, yeah, we can't completely speak freely. Always. You a fan of team bull riding? Um, I'm a, I'm a fan of PBR global cup. Me too. I'm a fan of love that. the global cup. Right. You're wearing and, your country on your yes. sleeves all the way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and Flint, I have yet to Matt and I've had some conversations about this and we've had some good ones about Matt West. Know, starting to pre yeah, yeah, Matt West, sorry. About you know how this presentation is going to go because it will be different than what we normally do. But um yeah, I I've it's gonna be interesting. You know, at the end of the day it's bull riding. That I just uh, there, I'm with you, you can you can put anything on top of it, format it the way that it is, whatever. But, you know, I'm glad you actually brought this up. (laughs) Yeah. Because college football and bull riding right now, for me, this is me personally speaking, are two things right now that are uncorruptible and haven't been captured by the what's going on in our nation. And the one thing that I love about bull riding is you can do whatever you want to do to it, paint it, put it in teams, do whatever, put it on a ship, put it in the back of a bus. It doesn't matter what you do with it. When you nod your head in the buck and shoot, there's not one person that's breathing air on this earth that can change whatever ultimate outcome is going to happen. You, you, there's, there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. You can put a little extra dirt and slow the bulls down. You can make the dirt a little bit harder and make the bulls buck, you know, better or, or be stronger, but it's the one thing that you just can't stop. There's just, as we can't manipulate it, Flint. Yeah. It is what it is. You know what I'm saying? And it's just, that's, that's, that's what I love about it. So, you know, we'll see about, how it's all going to go. I, I think it's an interesting concept and, and I can't wait to get the full. See, it's hard to make an assumption on something when, you know, we've really not had any full details on it. We've, we've got a little bit about it. We'll see, you know, I mean, I'm going to have, I'm going to, I'm like you, I'm going to see how it all kind of fleshes itself out. And, and the only thing that gives me pause is the scheduling is the timing of it. Uh, that's the one thing that I, I wish that, you know, next year we were going to start our UTB season season in October. Yeah, maybe that. That's, maybe that's the, the end. Thing. Even the first of November. Try maybe get or, three yeah. or 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 yeah. yeah, end of October. Get four events out of the way. Mm-hmm. First, yeah. the thing I like about not not the one thing, but what I respect about our CEO Sean Gleason. Like people, you and I talked. We were concerned that. Hey, we got to start this schedule. We're going to do some events over the NFR. Some of yeah, us work at yeah. the NFR, and I don't. Yeah. I think there's a there's a real respect towards rodeo from PBR. Yeah. I don't know if that people understand internally Huge. what goes on. Well, why would I'm we want- turning I'm turning my Dish Network back on to watch the NFR? Yeah, 
and there's a I respect mean, for what the attention yeah. the NFR draws. Why would yeah. we? Why would we do something during the NFR? Yeah, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. So, but maybe get three or four out of the way October, November, going into the first of the year. Then you're already. You, you don't have to cram them all in. Right at the end. Right. Of the year, right. So. Uh, you you mentioned Sean, and I I have to say. The, the another thing that I like about him, and, and you got to keep this for the fans, and you and I, and and the fans that are watching this this team's deal develop. Sean ultimately understands the same fact that we kind of opened this show with when we were discussing Cody Teal and Alves, and 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 guys getting complacent and being able to push themselves to the edge. Okay, we just we're coming off one of the greatest PBR World Finals in PBR history. And the one thing about Sean that I love about him is is he's not going to let himself sit back in that chair and go, well, okay, let's just continue to run down the road. The UTB is awesome and we're going to continue to go down it. But in order to grow the growth of the sport. You've got to be willing to take some chances, and you got to be willing to push it to the edge. And uh, he's uh, he's going to take this, and we're going to go push it to the edge, and we're going to see if the true skills uh, and the artistry of the sport is going to push itself and man- manifest something really cool. We'll see. Yeah, we're that's what we're going to find out. Uh, I'll kind of to wrap up a little bit. I'm going to go off what you said about. No matter how you can put it on the deck of an aircraft carrier, you can whatever. I've always said when we go to New York City, especially, that's my example. Mm -hmm. You can throw sponsors on guys. You can ride them in limos. You can give them a million dollars for live for for winning. But when we go to a place like a New York City, they still want to see cowboys. They want that's right. Yes, ma'am. No, sir. Let me open the door for you. So no matter what we do, that's That, that, that's the, the middle part that you can't, you can't change is that part. Absolutely. There's no doubt, you know, there's no doubt, buddy. Um, Clint, I don't want to keep you. I know you have tea to drink and sit there under that blanket. Well, well, Uh, my daughter just got back from college and, and, and again, it's, it's, it's that day that we're going to go have uh, brisket tacos at Frank's and Fortunately, my maybe run into off. Cody Johnson. Well, here's the problem. And I'm, <laughs> listen, I've already talked. To, I'm going to see Cody. If, he might be there. I don't know. But we're going to go watch him in Easton uh, here in Beaumont here in a couple of weeks. But I'm going to bring this up to him. The problem is we love he and I both love going to Frank Stockos. OK, <laughs> but Frank ended up naming the best dang taco that he makes. It's now the official Cody Johnson brisket taco. And so do you got one? What What's have. yours? What's yours going to be? Is well, it, that's no, bullshit, that's man. The, well, I would <laughs> want my name on the best taco and it's on, well, Cody's got his name on that. So, hmm. I mean, there's not another taco yeah. I'll eat. So I'm going to go down and have two Cody Johnson brisket it, tacos. His next right. big song is going to be dear tacos. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the point. I'm gonna give hey, me I'm the gonna point. Tell him, I'm gonna tell him you said that. Yeah, you tell him. <laughs> well, Clint, well, oh remember, gosh. remember, no matter what anybody else ever done, it it will do in a in an announcing career. Mm. You still are the only announcer to crawl over a fence, gear up, and get on a bull during a show. That's Old three true. spot. He's that's true. He might have had a pacemaker and braces on his legs, but you got on him, Clint. I did. <laughs> you know, it's funny you brought that up because Ty and I were walking out of the T-Mobile Arena. I don't know what night it was, and I had, you know what? And I don't mind sharing this with everybody. This is this is actually, you know what? I'm pretty proud of this right here, and and uh, you know, for the last, I don't know how many times I've been the PBR World Final, 16, 17 times. Uh, for the last. I would say 12 to 13 years. I've I always go to the television meetings mm-hmm. before we have our production meeting. And at the PBR world finals, <clears throat> there's JW Hart, Justin McBride, Cody Lambert, and Ty Murray. <sighs> and so for an hour and 30 minutes for however many that long of years, I've been going into those meetings and I go sit down in the corner and I shut my mouth and I open my ears and I will listen to them go through that broadcast. And what happens is they're going down line by line on each of what they're going to do. 
there's always is a conversation that leads off of that. Uh-huh. And that conversation is about competition and it's about winning. And I personally have been so fortunate that, that I've been able to sit there and I have gotten a master's class at how you become a winner in Western sports for the last 12, 13 years. It has been so eye opening. And after, you know, Ty and I were talking about that walking down the building. He's like, yeah, man, you know, by gosh, everything that you know now listening to us, you, I bet you could have rode three spot like that. You know, why don't we get you on a bull? And I'm like, whoa, I'm 47 years old, man. I'll explode like a watermelon. You know I mean? That's not happening. So uh, Great points. Great yeah, points. So Clint, I never take for granted who we get to be around. It's yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's no um, doubt. It's something. So to, to to drill down in the minds of the greatest in Western sports has been an amazing process, and I'm so fortunate to have been able to uh, to get yeah. it. So there you go, Clint. It is. It's a pleasure, man. Great hour with you. Oh, uh, pleasure's all mine. It's, it, I crave the the deep thinking like you bring, and that's why I wanted to have you on. Okay. Thanks for everything, my friend. You bet, man. Anytime, anytime. Enjoyed it, Clint. You Thank got you. it.